Megcram. Welcome to another Megcram lecture. In our previous lecture, we talked about preload. What's preload? Basically, the amount of stretch on this ventricle, either the left or the right. And we found out that there was a relationship between preload and the actual work that was being done, so that if preload was increased, the amount of work being done would also increase. And we thought that preload was a pretty good thing to have, especially if you wanted these ventricles to work, that if you lost the atrial kick due to atrial fibrillation, you would lose that preload, and that could be disastrous in some patients, depending on how dependent they are on that preload. But we also talked about the fact that sometimes preload's not all that great, and that if you have a lot of preload, especially in coronary disease, that increased preload will decrease your coronary perfusion pressure to your myocardium, and that there's some medicines like nitrates that actually reduce the preload by causing venodilation and reducing the pressure in these areas like the right atrium and the left atrium. Now I want to kind of switch gears and talk about afterload. We kind of alluded to this before, Afterload, as opposed to being the amount of fluid in the ventricle or the amount of volume in the ventricle prior to contraction, afterload, basically speaking, is the tension that must be overcome to have ventricular contraction. So I want you to think about this as though it was the resistance to the heart contracting. So think about this as aortic resistance, aortic impedance. Think of this as the total peripheral vascular resistance. Also think about viscosity of the blood. So if you have a hematocrit, that is greater than 55. Think about that as being the problem. The thing that you'll see quite a bit is this law of Laplace. And basically that is that tension is equal to the pressure and the radius divided by 2H. And this is kind of what happens in hypertensive heart disease. Tension is basically the amount of contractile forces that have to be done in the heart to, to generate that pressure, to generate that force. P is the pressure that has to be generated against. This is kind of the afterload, if you will. R is the radius of the inside diameter of the ventricle. And H is the actual thickness of the myocardium. So if we were to draw a normal myocardium, what would this look like? T is kind of the, the tension that's around the entire heart, okay? P is the pressure that's being exerted in the middle. R is the actual radius of the of the ventricle. And so you can see here that if the pressure goes up because someone has systemic hypertension, if the pressure goes up here, you can see that tension has to go up here. The heart doesn't like that. The heart wants to keep tension at the same rate. So it has two choices. It's got to drop the radius and it's got to increase the actual thickness of the myocardium. And so by doing that, you can see here that one of the compensatory mechanisms is to thicken the myocardium and at the same time this reduces the radius and so as a result the radius drops and the thickness increases and that offsets the increase in pressure that we have with systemic hypertension. But another way you can look at this is actually what happens during the normal ventricular cycle. Let's take a look. In a normal ventricular cycle, you can imagine here is the heart, and here is a thin myocardium. And then when the actual ventricle contracts, it's going to contract down, being smaller, and the ventricle is actually going to be thicker. And so what's going to happen there in terms of the tension or the afterload? T is the afterload in this case. The pressure is going to stay the same, 
okay? The radius, uh, the radius is actually going to decrease, right? The radius is this part from the middle to the inside edge, and that certainly has decreased here on contraction. And then finally, the H, which is the thickness, is going to increase. And so what happens to T during the contraction of a ventricle from the end of diastole to the end of systole is that the tension actually decreases. Now, of course, this is assuming that all the blood is going into the aorta. Let's look at another possibility here. And let's say that the, the left ventricle is not pumping blood into the aorta, but let's say we've got mitral regurgitation and that blood is going right back into the left atrium. If it's going into the left atrium, that's a much lower pressure chamber than the aorta. And so you can see how the afterload would drop even more rapidly. Another possibility is an ASD or, or sorry, a VSD, where the blood in the left ventricle is actually being pushed over to the blood in the right ventricle. That's also a lower pressure chamber and therefore the, the afterload would drop pretty quickly. So let's talk about some real world examples here in medicine and what could happen. I once had a patient who I knew had a problem with their mitral valve. And in this situation, if you've got a problem with the mitral valve in terms of regurgitation, blood likes to go into the left atrium and go back into the lungs and cause pulmonary edema. Now, what was causing a lot of this blood to go back into the left atrium was the fact that the blood pressure in the patient's aorta was very high. And as a result of that, blood had a choice when it was being pumped here in the left ventricle. It could either go out through the aorta where it was supposed to, and of course it wasn't going to do that as much because the blood pressure was high, or it could go back, as we mentioned, into the left atrium where the blood pressure is much lower. And so it has a choice. Now, because the blood pressure in the aorta was much higher, a lot of the blood was going back into the left atrium and it was causing pulmonary edema. And this patient, you could tell, was having frothy pulmonary edema, was coughing up pink frothy sputum, was in a lot of distress, and as a result of that, the blood pressure kept on getting higher and higher and higher. And as it got higher, more and more blood was going into the left atrium. So what I did for this patient was I put them on something called CPAP, which is continuous positive airway pressure. And that put pressure on the alveolus to push the fluid back so that the patient wasn't struggling to breathe. It also made their lungs lighter because I was pushing fluid out of their lungs back into the pulmonary vein. The next thing I did was I gave the patient some labetalol. Now labetalol, as some of you may know, is an alpha one and a beta blocker. It's nonspecific. And so what happened here is because it's an alpha blocker is I was able to dilate the peripheral vasculature and reduce the blood pressure in the aorta. And as a result, more blood started to go through the aortic valve into the aorta. Why? Because I decreased afterload. And by decreasing afterload, I was able to allow more cardiac output to come into the aorta and less to go back from the left ventricle into the left atrium. And literally within minutes of giving this injection of labetalol, the patient went from being in distress, coughing up pink frothy sputum, to having a lower blood pressure. As soon as the blood pressure came down, you could see that things started to clear up. The uh, oxygen saturation came up, the respiratory rate slowed down, and the patient did much better. In this situation, I was able to reduce not only the afterload, but I was also to reduce the preload here that was pushing back on to the lungs and causing pulmonary edema. Uh, another issue with uh, preload and afterload is in sepsis. And in sepsis, your preload is reduced because your total peripheral vascular resistance drops because of septic shock. Now, as a result of your total peripheral vascular resistance dropping, you're going to become more tachycardic. And your cardiac output may actually increase 
But the issue here is that your preload drops. And when your preload drops, you're going to have to beat faster to increase the cardiac output to the lungs back to the left ventricle. And so the treatment there is fluids. So, so far we learned about preload and we learned about afterload. And both these things are very important. One of the things that we talk about in the ventilator lecture, which I hope you look at, is the effect of PEEP on all of this. If you have high amounts of PEEP, what that's going to do is putting a lot of pressure on the lungs. That's the positive end expiratory pressure. Remember what that's going to do is that positive end expiratory pressure is going to make sure that the lungs are at a higher pressure. Well, the thing you've got to remember is, is that especially the right side of the heart sits in the same area as the lungs. And therefore, the pressure will also go up in and around the vena cava. Now, as you recall, in the venous system, things go from a high pressure system and they flow down to a low pressure system. So this is the, the peripheral veins and this is actually where the heart is. So there's this flow, there's this difference in pressure which causes flow to occur. If I increase the PEEP in the lungs, that's the positive end expiratory pressure, that's going to increase the pressure in the thoracic cavity where the heart sits. The heart, instead of the heart sitting here, now the heart is going to be up a little bit more and it's going to sit here, which means that the flow back to the heart is not going to be as quick. That means your venous return is going to drop and therefore in your aorta, your cardiac output is going to drop. Now that may be advantageous because in addition, your afterload may drop as well. And why is that? Because the left side of your heart also sits in the thoracic cage. And as a result of that, if this is the pressure that your left ventricle pumps blood at, and this is the pressure in the aorta, so this is aorta, and this is the pressure at left ventricular end diastole, or the LVEDP, so this is the pressure in the left ventricle right before contraction. That means every time the heart contracts, it needs to bring the pressure up to that of the aorta before the aortic valve will open and blood will enter into the aorta. Well, if I put PEEP on the patient, that means the lungs are going to be at a higher pressure. And because the left ventricle is sitting in there, that means now, instead of the left ventricular end diastolic pressure being here, it's also going to be increased to this level. And as a result, the afterload, which used to be this, is now going to be this. So here's the bottom line with PEEP. PEEP decreases not only the preload, but it decreases the afterload. So PEEP may be very beneficial in patients with congestive heart failure, because in congestive heart failure, you have a problem with too much preload, and you have a problem with too much afterload, and it reduces both. However, in sepsis or dehydration, where preload is a problem being low and you want it to be high, PEEP may actually cause problems and drop blood pressure. Okay, so we talked about preload and afterload, and I hope those terms have been clear to you because we'll use those in the future when we continue to talk on congestive heart failure. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.